Welcome to the How Epidemics End project based at the University of Oxford. My name is Erica Charters, and in these videos, I'll be discussing how experts research disease in a variety of ways, as well as how they investigate how epidemics end. Today, I'm here with Virginia Barrage, who's Professor of History and Health Policy at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK. Virginia, you trained as a historian, but you work very specifically on health policy. Can you explain what you mean by health policy and how you research it? Yes, um, well, health policy is um, not just the formal acts of government or the regulations that they pass, which people sometimes think it is, but it's much more about how decisions get taken, what sort of decisions get taken by governments, and um, who influences that. Um, what's the role of politicians, expertise, experts, um, bureaucrats within government, civil servants, what sort of networks operate, um, whether activist groups are involved outside government. Um, so basically how um, decisions are taken, why they're taken, and how they change over time as well. And in order to research that, I can use some very traditional historians source material, um, government archives and other archives if they're available. Although um, in the case of researching very recent events like um, HIV, when I first worked on it and swine flu more recently, um, those archives weren't available because in Britain we have uh, a 20 year rule now, it used to be a 30 year rule about access to government archives. So they're mostly not available if you're working on very recent events. Um, but it's also possible to use uh, printed sources, for example, the proceedings of Hansard, parliamentary proceedings, and also grey literature um, is important. Uh, reports from organisations which are available, um, obviously increasingly online, um, also in, in a kind of informal format. Um, but as well as that, because um, I've been working on, on very recent material, uh, very recent events, then oral history interviews are um, of great importance. So you've worked on a variety of health issues in contemporary, that is in, in recent British history, uh, typhus, cholera, even the Spanish flu. But as you mentioned, you also have worked extensively on swine flu and on HIV AIDS. So can you tell us a little bit about those two recent epidemics? Yeah, I mean, HIV obviously was a, and remains a global epidemic um, starting really to be discussed in the UK uh, because of what was going on in America or in countries like Haiti uh, or in African countries. Um, in the UK, it started to make an impact in the early 1980s. Uh, people started to become concerned around about 1983. Um, and I think the government reaction came on stream really from 1986, 1987 onwards. So when I was first working on it as part of something called the AIDS Social History Programme at the London School of Hygiene, it was very much um, what people called history in the making, um, researching things that really sometimes hadn't happened um, uh, very long before I was actually researching them. That's quite an unusual thing for a historian to do. Um, as far as swine flu was concerned, swine flu was um, a rather different kettle of fish, I think. HIV had been very unexpected. People weren't used to epidemics in the early 1980s. They thought that public health was all about chronic disease rather than epidemic disease. By the early 21st century, uh, I think people are more used to the idea of uh, there might be epidemic disease. Um, we'd had SARS, we'd had things like BSE, foot and mouth disease and so on. So the idea of an epidemic was no longer quite so unusual and people were planning for it. And SARS, um, swine flu first came on the scene in 2009 um, in, in Mexico and then transferred 
globally. It came into England uh, that spring. Um, and the, there was a high level reaction quite early on. So rather different to HIV when uh, the possibility of a government reaction took a bit longer to achieve, I think. So you've, you've called these two epidemics, these two recent epidemics, tracer epidemics in your scholarship. What do you mean by tracer epidemics? What are they, what are they tracing? Well, they're tracing their case studies in their own right. They're of interest to look at how a state responds to epidemic disease. But by looking at um, the two in conjunction and comparing them and contrasting them, you can get some kind of idea about how states uh, respond to epidemics, how, um, as Charles Rosenberg said many, many years ago, uh, epidemics throw light on, on the workings of, of of states, um, but also how, how that changes over time and how different epidemics produce uh, different responses, how the state itself has changed and the component parts of what makes policy also have changed over time. So they're tracing that really. So they're, they're individual topics, uh, but I think they have a, something broader to say um, about how we respond to epidemics. So one of these broader points, the one of the, I think, very useful insights you've made is how there's a medical end to an, to an epidemic, but there's also a political end. What's the difference between the two and, and how do we apply this? Well, I think that the political end um, can come sometime before the epidemic act, well, uh, actually, actually peters out. I mean, there, there are always political benefits or disbenefits uh, to governments from epidemics. And sometimes, as in the case of HIV, um, it, it took some while for um, to get the, the politicians within government um, involved. The bureaucrats, the, the medical bureaucrats in particular, uh, had been involved for some while and activist groups outside government had also been pressing for action. Uh, but government itself, the, the politicians, couldn't see an advantage to this for quite some long while. And then I think the idea that this was going, that HIV was going to be uh, a totally overwhelming epidemic, which devastated the whole population, came very much centre stage. And suddenly government was galvanised into action and a cabinet committee on HIV was set up and everything was, was high level, very high level emergency. Uh, the deputy prime minister, William Whitelaw was in charge and so on. Um, but politicians are, all, uh, are very canny and they can use an epidemic for their own purposes. And so the government used it um, to get what it wanted in certain areas, for example, getting rid of the uh, Health Education Council, which had been in char charge of public information and replacing it with a body called the Health Education Authority, which was just focused on HIV. Um, and so you see that in other epidemics where governments use them to, you know, move the, move the chairs around uh, in terms of institutions and uh, use the epidemic uh, as a, a kind of rationale for that. Um, but that high level political response, I think, uh, in the case of HIV, didn't last that long. Um, by the year after the, when the cabinet committee had been set up, um, there was rather a feeling that the, the epidemic had been overhyped. There wasn't going to be this general population devastation. Um, and the idea that it had all been a gay conspiracy uh, began to take hold. And that was kind of leaked gently to the media at the time. And so uh, journalists who were close to government were writing those sort of pieces in the newspapers. So the government withdrew to a degree. So for the politicians, the epidemic had come to an end as a high level uh, policy issue. Obviously, they continued to be involved in areas like uh, the politics of public information campaigns, want, what went into those, and also in particular in school sex education matters. 
which had a lot of political intervention, but the sort of high level uh, uh, political intervention was at an end. So for politicians, HIV was no longer the issue that it had been. Um, now, if you look at swine flu, there were similar issues. Uh, politicians was, were, and it was a different a government of a different complexion in 2009. It was a Labour government. Um, but politicians were still weighing up what advantage the epidemic was to them. And in that case, the high level response, the um, policy of containing the epidemic uh, with contact tracing, closing schools, uh, medication and so on, um, was popular with the public and the public were concerned that swine flu was going to spread more widely. And so politicians wanted to continue with that high level response. So, you know, big contrast with HIV. Um, but people at the ground level felt, and within some of the public health institutions, felt that it really wasn't working, that it couldn't be, um, it couldn't be used for much longer. It was, you know, really kind of creaking at the seams. Um, but they couldn't get that through to politicians. Politicians were very gung-ho for this kind of high-level response. And it was only with a change of politician as the Minister of Health uh, when Andy Burnham took over uh, and came to see what was going on on the ground, um, that that high level response came to an end. So I think there's a contrast between the two epidemics. With one, politicians, it came to an end politically uh, quite early on. Uh, with the other one, uh, the political benefit was, was greater. And so politicians wanted to continue um, beyond perhaps when they should have done. I think it's a it's a useful insight to think about how there's these different endings within different groups. And if you pointed out, there's obviously a, a kind of media ending, there's the medical ending, there's the political ending, but also then the tensions and the clashes between different groups as they debate um, and sometimes argue over uh, when it has ended and who, who it has ended for. But I was also really struck by, you mentioned at some point, this phrase, which probably everyone's heard of now, how we're not at the end, but perhaps we're at the beginning of the end. And you've traced this back, actually, to the HIV AIDS epidemic. Yes, I think that was something it was used in. I've been trying to track it down because it was used very widely. And I think it has been used recently in relation to COVID as well, with the coming of vaccination and so on. Um, and I think it was used when um, AZT started to come on the scene um, in the States and also subsequently in the UK and elsewhere, um, a sense that the, the disease was still there, uh, but it was becoming a different sort of disease. It was becoming a manageable disease and it was becoming less epidemic and perhaps more chronic, something that you would manage with medication. And people would kind of in a sense, longing for this to be able to take place. And they would talk about things like, you know, a disease like diabetes. And that was the model of what they wanted HIV to become. Thank you very much, Virginia, for sharing your expertise and for helping us to think about the difference between policy and political endings and medical endings. And thank you all very much for watching the videos. Please do fill out a feedback form. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll find the feedback form just below the video. If you're watching on the project website, you'll find it just to the right. It takes just a few seconds and it will help to shape future research at the University of Oxford.